Welcome to episode 18 of the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. On tonight's show, we have Robbie Dinning. Robbie was a guest with us in episode 13, and he's back for more. Talking more about how to take the best buck of your life. Robbie's a mule deer expert, and you don't want to miss our discussion tonight as we dive deep into some specific tactics that could help you take the best mule deer of your life. Before we get into the show, let's talk about two giveaways. First, hopefully you caught our last episode with Land Tawny of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. We're doing a little promotion with them. If you sign up uh, to become a member or renew your membership with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, send us proof of that to podcast at exomountaingear.com, and we will drop your name in a hat uh, to win a $50 gift card from SNS Archery. Big thanks to Stephen Robb of SNS Archery for giving away that gift card for you, the listeners. Secondly, Exo Mountain Gear. We're giving away a complete pack system of your choice. You can choose the 3500 or the 5500, your color. You can get what you want. To enter, it's really simple. Go to exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway. There you'll get all the information. You can enter as simple as sending your email in or plugging into the giveaway widget with Facebook. And then there's some opportunities to earn bonus entries. One of those bonus entries is for you, the listeners of this podcast. If you enter the keyword this week, ultra tough, you will get five bonus points. That means your name's in the hat five more times for this giveaway. We also had a bonus keyword on the last episode, so be sure that you go check that one out as well. You can enter both of those keywords. Um, You can only enter one per day, and you can only enter each one one time. So anyway... Go check it out, exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway. Um, be sure you enter to win the Exo Mountain Gear, Exo Mountain Gear pack of your choice. All right, on to tonight's show with Robbie Dinning, talking mule deer. The Hunt Pack Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra tough packs that are designed to do what you love most hunt the backcountry. Exo packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. Cool. Well, Robbie, uh, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate you coming on again. You bet. It was enjoyable. And like I said before, love talking about mule deer hunting. Absolutely. Steve, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm excellent. Good. Hanging in there, man. Getting over my cold. and Yeah. Yeah. So we're here. We're uh, post-Thanksgiving, pre-Christmas. There's, you know, most of the seasons are wrapping up, including the late season stuff, but there's still a few things trickling and going on uh, around the West. But tonight we want to continue the conversation with Robbie that we had a few episodes ago talking about mule deer um, and specifically talking about um, some of the ideas, uh, techniques and content covered in Robbie's book, how to take the best buck of your life. Um, and specifically tonight, we want to dive into just a part of that book, um, a section part six, and that's techniques to kill the best buck of your life. So before we dive into that really detailed Robbie, what's kind of the overview and thought behind this part six of your book and these techniques? Well, um, you know, I kind of, as, as we talked about in the first uh, podcast, um, I, I f- covered all the essentials, the gear, uh, research, you know, all those important things on choosing an area to hunt. But even if you are hunting in a really good unit, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get spanked. Uh, you're just wait. You're just hoping on luck. And, you know, I hear everybody say, hey, man, I'd rather be lucky than good. Man, not me. I'd rather be good than lucky. Yeah. Because, um, you know, a lot of us DIY hunters, number one, we're going to be hunting over-the-counter units most years. So you really got to know what you're doing. But I think it also applies to hunting even our draw units. And most of us will draw, pull a good draw tag here and there. Um, and the problem with draw tags is you get one shot at your unit, you know, and you don't know it very well. Uh, weather's always a factor, you know, it can, it can push the hunt either way. And so your one shot, you, you, all you got to rely on are your techniques. And 
these techniques that I lay out in the book, um, I think will work just about anywhere in the West on any hunt, um, given the conditions and, and, and the conditions are what's going to determine most of the time, which technique that you're using. Yeah. And so I, I really think it's, it's the meat and potatoes of the book, all the other stuff, super important. You got to be hunting where there's big bucks, but you can be where there's big bucks and still not get one. And so many guys are shocked when they pull a good draw tag and then they don't see a big buck or they don't kill a big buck. They're just shocked. And it's because they're still wild bucks. They're hard to kill. I mean, I, I manage 6,500 acres of private land that we, we manage from yielder and they're still hard to kill. Right. It's, so you really, you really got to know your techniques and you got to be out there practicing them yearly and uh, kind of, you know, honing your skills and working on your craft because that's really all you can rely on. The weather's going to change. The, the draw odds are going to change. I mean, all these things you can't control are, are, are always going to be out there, but you can control your hunting skills. Yeah, for sure. So one of the first things mentioned in that section, um, really good information, you know, before we dive into techniques of stalking or ambush hunting or anything like that is just identifying um, buck country. And so part of that is certainly when your boots on the ground in your unit. And then part of that can be preseason scouting, maybe even some of the digital scouting, but you know, this could certainly be an episode in and of itself, but kind of talk a little bit about that idea of recognizing buck country. Sure. Um, in the earlier part of the book, I talked about, you know, big picture research, uh, figuring out your state, figuring out your unit. And then I go into what I call small picture research, which is exact hillsides, basins, ridges that you're going to be hunting. And some of that can be done, you know, Google Earth and, you know, maps and, you know, stuff like that. But I put it in the technique section because I think that you have to learn to recognize buck country day by day on the hunt. Too many people just think in, in, in big picture terms. They think, okay, I'm in the unit. This unit produces big deer. I, I'm there. But I think most units of the West, your, your bucks that you're hunting, the ones that you're going to be happy with, they're probably only in about 10 to 20% of the unit. I did a series on the blog earlier this fall called Hunting the Pockets. And that name came from the idea that, you know, you don't just walk into a unit and hunt the whole thing. You hunt the deer country. You hunt the small pockets of deer country where the bucks are. There may be deer through the whole unit, but typically the mature bucks are going to congregate in certain areas because of terrain, uh, thermals, feed, water, remoteness, which might only be half a mile from a road if nobody's bugging them. Right. And so I really go into that in the book about, about learning to recognize those areas because then you can focus your limited hunting time and energy. We, we always have less energy than we think we're going to have when we get out there. I'm a firm believer in that. It's too easy to sit here, you know, months ahead of the hunting season and think, you know, I, I, I'm going to hunt 10 days straight and I'm just going to kill it. Well, you get out there, you get tired and the weather's, weather's bad and you don't get enough sleep. So it's super important to be hunting in the right areas and not jumping all over the place. So learning to recognize buck country is, is super important. And it, it, I think it, it changes a little bit depending on the zones that you're hunting. I talk about different zones that bucks live in, you know, high country that gets a lot of press these days, or that's certainly not the only place that big bucks live. Um, you know, your foothill transitional type country can grow some huge bucks because that's typically where the best cover is. And then, you know, all the way down into river bottoms and deserts. But I've noticed in all of those different zones that the bigger bucks are usually attracted to the rougher country. Now, it can't be solid rock goat country. You know, there's there's got to be feed. Um, but it's typically rougher country. And I reference this in the book. There's some foothills just east of town where I live here that, that hold relatively few bucks. But the bucks that are there can almost always be found around the rims, the knobs, you know, the coolies, kind of the rougher stuff. You may find deer throughout the range, but the bucks are typically attracted to rougher country. Um, and so that's part of learning to recognize deer country. And, and you said the phrase, you know, boots on the ground. I mean, we, we kind of wore that phrase out, but it's, 
it's really what you kind of got to do to get out there and, and, and really refine that skill. You can only do so much on Google Earth. Yeah. And, um, you know, until they, si- they, they start a live satellite feed, God forbid, you're not finding bucks on Google Earth. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of guys get goofed up by Google Earth if they're not used to looking for big buck country. And so if you want some example country, you know, just just take a look at the at the Grays River and, and the Hoback in Wyoming. If you know, pull it up on Google Earth, most of that country, save the really, really rocky stuff that doesn't have any deer feed in it. Most of that country's pretty representative of the type of high country that's in the West where big bucks are going to be. Mixture of timber, uh, green, big green slopes, that's your buck feed. doesn't matter if you know the names of it or if you can even recognize it when you're on the ground. It doesn't matter. The bucks know what it is. And and that's the kind of stuff that you're looking for in the high country. And then, you know, when you get into transitional range and foothills and stuff like that, it's your mesas, it's your coolies, it's your, you know, draws, you know, stuff, stuff like that. And that'll get you started. But until you Oh, one more zone, desert. I don't find bucks in the flat, flat desert. They are still typically around the rougher parts of desert country. Um, you know, maybe this, it's, it's not even rough enough to really have canyons, but they'll be around those, those draws and, you know, little rough spots in the train as long as there's deer feed. And um, once, once you kind of understand that, then once you're out in the field, you can begin to recognize those places instead of thinking, okay, I'm, I can spend all day walking five miles through this, you know, these foothills here, or I can, I can pick out two or three different places and they, that might only be 20, 30 acres. That's why I talk about pockets so much because then, then you can spend your limited time hunting there. Yeah. Do you, just curious, do you, um, connecting terrain features like maybe between these pockets factor in for example i've always had so much um success targeting saddles um when elk hunting or is any of that a factor for mule deer hunting uh, maybe at a certain point in the season absolutely and i think in all those habitat zones specifically talking about saddles saddles are, are 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 a hot place to watch for deer and deer activity they're lazy just like us they don't want to hike any higher than they have to so you know you spook one yeah he'll run right over the top of the highest ten thousand foot peak to get away from you but in their day-to-day activities you bet they're going to use low spots in the terrain and the ridges i was hunting some desert country on a live hunt earlier this year and uh you know semi-desert kind of you know rolling type desert and I found the same thing, even down there in the desert, that, that these bucks were, were using the low spots in the ridges. They weren't even a real definite saddle, but the bucks would still, you know, if I was setting up for an ambush, I was, I was usually finding bucks in those spots. So, so definitely there with, um, with, with saddles. Um, I think rough terrain attracts big mule deer because they can use their eyes somewhat. You know, you, when, when you're in, when you're in rough terrain, you you, you, you you can see further just like a hunter out hiking it's so easy to get lost in flat terrain but if you're in steep terrain you can kind of get a bearing on things so i think bucks can use that to their advantage i think cut up rough terrain also um has squirrely thermals so they like that you know the wind changes direction a lot yeah yeah that's really good and mention one more time because i know i know we're going to get the question i've already gotten it from previous episodes that we've done and talking about mule deer, talking about scouting, especially for the guys who are newer. Um, maybe they're hunting out of state. Maybe they're coming from the East or Midwest going out West and they are looking to narrow down some areas within a unit using tools like Google earth or topographic maps. You mentioned, um, a good place to look in Google earth to identify what buck country looks like. And then you can then take that sort of, um, idea to the place that you might be hunting what was that place again that you'd look at as a good reference point of buck country within google earth well i had just mentioned you know western wyoming is kind of real typical of the high country type that shows the high country zone um if i was looking at um I, I don't remember saying an exact spot. I mean, I go to so many places, but if I was looking at, you know, lower, you know, foothill type country, um, um, I would probably look at something in that probably seven, 8,000 foot range of, of Western Colorado, you know, maybe around, uh, you know, Grand Junction 
on down to Ridgeway, not the high country, but, you know, kind of that lower type zone. I would look at that stuff, but I think there's a better tip I can give people because Google Earth, we're too dependent on it. it it's, it's way more limiting than we think. Um, I think that small picture research that I talk about in the book of, of talking to the people that have their boots on the ground. And yeah, that can start with biologists, definitely game wardens. And there are biologists in all of our different land management agencies, like Forest Service will employ biologists, um, BLM does. Um, you know, the people that are out in the field, they can really help you narrow down these places just about fa- just as, as, as quick as anything we can do online because you know they may they may reference you know a drainage or a or a place where where where, where they've seen bucks or you know people hunt and and even though you might be thinking well yeah they're probably telling everybody that it still gives you an idea of the type of habitat that the bucks are using in that unit so then you can pull it up on google earth and you can look at it and say okay this is this is a transitional quaking aspen you know brush type country and that's where they said the bucks are so now i'm going to use that information to look around in other parts of the unit and you know these these areas change per season too you know colorado has three deer seasons and you know every season is a little bit different for the habitat type that they're using but you can still get a a pretty good idea of it by talking to people and and until you're really skilled i (laughs) google earth can can spread you real thin yeah all right so let's say we have a unit maybe have a place um let's talk about then it's one of the next topics in this section of your book, which I thought was incredibly helpful, and that is moving in deer country. Um, something that I think guys have questions about, or the danger is just to overlook it, period. But things in terms of how we move, how fast we move, um, and then obviously just our presence in human sign. You would have some great points in the book if you could kind of talk about moving within deer country. You bet. And I think we talked about this a little bit in podcast number one is that we, you first, you got to realize that a mule deer is a completely different creature than we are. Just completely different. They can hear and see and smell so much better than us. And until you spend a lot of time with them, you don't realize how easy they detect you in the forest. And it don't matter if I'm packing a rifle that I can shoot 800 yards away. You're you're still leaving a big, not a literal footprint, but a big footprint when you go out there. And so that's why I put a whole, I dedicated a whole chapter to moving in deer country because it's, especially today, you know, people are hunting long range or or glassing long range. We kind of forget about everything that's going on in our immediate vicinity, but if if you're, if you're a careful reader of my book, you'll see I've killed most of my bucks under 200 yards. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. We won't cover it just, just right now. But but getting around in the forest in, in, in the deer country, you've got to be careful. And it's it, it's completely underestimated by, by people. And I still screw it up all the time myself. And uh, the goal on, to, to kill a big buck, you've got to see him and be able to get off an accurate shot before he can get away. That sounds so simple, but go hunt 20 years and you'll find that, wow, that's where the rubber meets the road. They're, they're getting away before I can get a bullet or an arrow in them um, because I'm not moving right in deer country. I'm not getting the drop on them. So that gets down to the, to, to the cadence that you move at. You know, the forest has a rhythm and a, and a, and a, and a man just tromping through the forest in a size 12 boot um, and he can't even feel the ground below his uh, his feet um, is making so much noise, <laughs> and so moving in deer can, and, and then not to mention our scent. Um, a, a buck may allow, may see you, and may not run off. You know, he may give you that that quick second or two. Um, a buck may hear you and be curious enough to want to identify what it is without running off. But if he smells you, you are toast. They, I can't even think of one in my, in my, all my hunting that, 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 that smelled me and stuck around. Um, and so moving in deer country and, and consequently the next chapter, which is obeying the wind takes all that into consideration so that when you're in the forest, you're not just effective at seven, 800 yards out there, which is 
where everybody wants to be now, but you're going to kill most of them closer than that. You've got to, you've got to go in the forest. You got to be careful how you move. You've got to be, you can't, you, know, you can't expose yourself in the open unless you just are, are sure there's not a deer around. You can't skyline yourself. Um, all those things have to be taken into consideration. And, you know, 20 years ago, I, you would have never convinced me I'd have a whole chapter in my book about moving in deer country, but fast forward 20 years and think of the literally hundreds of big bucks that I've spooked moving through the woods. I, I finally realized, man, it's, it's, it's how I move. Yeah. And so that, that's a really important chapter, Mark. And I, I'm glad you kind of pulled it out of there. So how do you, um, how do you balance all those aspects with, um, for example, covering ground? I mean, you know, cause so many hunters, you know, maybe they don't have a glass buck. Um, maybe they don't have a buck glassed up. Maybe they want to move to another basin or, you know, get another vantage point and things like that. So how do you sort of balance the thought of, you know, moving carefully, moving with consideration versus getting from, you know, A to B? Well, uh, let me answer that by, by, um, kind of introducing the whole still hunting concept because when i'm talking about moving in deer country i'm not talking about still hunting that's another chapter still hunting is defined as you know hunting very slowly in an area known or thought to hold the bucks that you're looking for either by tracks by by previous sightings you know good intelligence whatever you know that, hey, I got I got to hunt this 30 acres right here and I got to hunt it right. And it doesn't matter if it takes five hours to do it. I got to do it right. Moving in deer country is more for, I don't really know where the bucks are. I'm just kind of learning this area or they could be anywhere. But unless you're just in wide open country, which is not very good after opening day in most units, you're going to have to move to see all the country in that one to two to three, four hours after sunrise when the bucks are up. And, 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 and I don't want to confuse people. There are some places you can sit and cover a lot of ground in three or four hours. I totally recommend that. That's in my glassing chapter. But I'm talking about showing up to a unit and it's like, well, there's no bucks in this, this area that I can see. Can't see anything out there at the mile away hillside, nothing on there. Wow, there's a lot of country be- between here and there. That's where moving in deer country becomes critical because you've got to be able to cover that country fast enough to see enough of it to have a chance to see a buck, yet not pollute it. And this stuff is an art. That's why I struggle a little bit talking about it. You're kind of you're kind of learning it by the by the by the step and by what's going on around you. You're taking in all conditions, everything that you're seeing kind of minute by minute on on how am I going to move and. And, and what am I going to do here? And, and I, I guess I, I would offer this. People just need to, including me, slow down, understand that if you want a big buck, you're probably not going to get one the first time, second time, third time, even fifth time that you try. You may go three, four years without being able to do that. Got a letter from a guy just the other day. That's exactly what happened, but he finally killed one on his fourth year. And and the reason that that's important is because then it gets that big rush out of your head. That, oh, God, I got to get over there. Oh, man, I got to check that draw. Oh, I got to be up on that ridge because that's what's screwing it up for you right there. Um, that's what screwed it up for me for years. So if you can find, if you can just get to the point of, you know what, I'm probably not going to get one unless I do it right. Doing it right takes time. Most people are not going to be able to cover as much ground as they think they need to. And that's fine. That's where you start to becoming a, becoming an effective hunter. And then once you start doing that enough, you're going to know what you can get away with, where you can get away with it, where, you know, walking out in the open is okay. And, you know, being noisy is okay. And where you got to be stealthy. You're going to know when to do that stuff. And, and I don't care if it's deer hunting or, you know, any, you take any profession that's out there. That's what separates professionals from the amateurs right there. The professionals know what they can get away with and the amateurs don't. They're, 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 they're either not paying attention to anything or they're, they're so hyper-focused on everything, they, don't, they never make any progress. I mean, I, 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 I was a concrete finisher when I, was, when I was young and I remember all the old concrete finishers that told me the reason we're faster than you is we know what we can leave and what, what we can't leave and you spend all your time making everything perfect. And, and that stuck with me as a deer hunter because I thought that's what happens when I go into the woods. I, I, I don't know what I can get away with 
And so I either throw everything, throw everything out the window, who cares? I'm just going to hunt or I never make any progress. And so there, there is a little parallel right there. And, and again, this stuff is an art and that's why you got to get out there and you got to do it. But every big buck hunter I talk to, and I'm not the only one, there's lots, I don't have the corner on this uh, big buck hunting. There's lots of them out there. Almost all of them I talk to will relate to this and they're, they're, they're slow, methodical hunters and they know what they can get away with. They know when to hurry and they know when to go slow. Yeah. I think it's such a key point. I mean, one thing that I struggle with, and this is, this isn't even with mule deer hunting. Um, but I just struggle in general with, you know, balancing, being patient, um, being considerate versus feeling like, well, I'm just sitting here not doing anything. You know, I should get over here. I should go over there. I should go check this country out. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, it's just, it, it is an art and certainly something that probably most of us need to grow in. I mean, as you said, you still blow it sometimes and you've been doing this, you know, 20 plus years. So there's the proof right there that it, you just got to keep, keep progressing and keep learning from those mistakes, I think. Yeah. And you gotta, you gotta understand that every trip to the woods is not wasted. You're learning something and, um, yeah, and you're going to build upon these experiences and, and the scenario you just gave of, well, maybe I should be over there or maybe I should be patient and be here. Um, that's going to take some time to, 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 to work that out and to kind of know those things. And then it's still a guess. I mean, sometimes you're still guessing. Um, but you know, you, you can be the most patient person in the world and, and sit in one spot all day. If there's not a big buck within rifle range, you ain't going to kill him. Right. And, and so sometimes you do got to get up and move and sometimes you do got to get somewhere. Um, but, and that's where it kind of all comes together for you when you've spent enough time in deer country, moving in deer country, you're going to know when to hurry and you're going to know when to be patient. Yeah. Hey, Robbie, is there like a, that's probably a hard question to answer, but is there like a distance that you feel is safe to be exposed? Say you're hiking across a basin and there's some deer 800 yards away. Are you going to stay in the shadows the whole time? Or if, if is 800 yards far enough away that you feel like you could walk across an opening and not have them spook? There's no distance that's, that's safe. Um, backing up to our first podcast, I kind of talked about that concentric circle, like you throw a rock in a pond and that little circle goes out and if it goes all the way to the opposite shore. Even if it's a mile away, it might take some time to get there. Every, every action in the forest produces a reaction. And I, even though I do it, and even though sometimes you're forced to, spooking deer, any deer, even a, a fawn, and it's a buck's only season and it's September, they're nowhere near each other, is is creating that concentric circle in the for, forest and creating um, alert deer. And so if I know where the deer are, I you know, it don't matter if they're 50 yards or a thousand yards, I don't let them see me. Because gotcha. so often, even outside of the rut, when bucks and does aren't together, they're, they're still in the same forest. They're still in the same deer country. And you watch enough deer, you'll, you'll see somebody spook a deer and you'll see a deer 400 yards away, stand up and look at it and move away. Mm -hmm. And so, so Steve, if I, if I can avoid spooking them, I all, that's, that's the rule I try to follow. Now it's not always possible. There's a great big buck across the basin. I got to walk through this cover to get to him. And there's deer in this cover. I'm going to bump a few deer. Yeah, that can happen. And yeah, it's backfired too. But, but no, the, you you want to you do not want to be detected. There's no level of, ex, of 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 acceptable detection in the forest. You just don't want them to know you're there. You don't want any of them to know you're there. Okay, gotcha. So, final question on that, and then we'll kind of dive into some um, other strategy talk. You know, I I've seen so many questions and forums and things like that. Then on this topic of, um, what do you do with camp? So for guys who are camping in the back country, whether they're backpacking in as a lot of our listeners do, or maybe horse packing in, et cetera. How careful are you, Robbie, with things like fires and, you know, other, um, impressions of human presence as you're camping in the back country and you're not necessarily sure exactly how far away your camp might be from bucks or your hunting grounds. Massively careful. Because in my younger days, I screwed up so many hunts by not being careful with my camp. If you, it, it sounds kind of cool to say, hey, we're seeing b big bucks from camp. No, if that's happening, you're screwing the hunt up. You better kill one right away because they're about to, to vacate the area. They can't know you're there. 
Now, I'm a horseman, so I have the advantage of being able to camp further away than what some people do. And I, and I kind of have to because horses are loud and clompy and whinny and make noise. But um, as a general, I don't even want to call this a rule because it just gets people too focused on a formula. And there's really no formulas in deer hunting. Um, it's um, about a mile, always downwind and in the trees. That's why if you follow my articles and my posts and everything, I don't have those really cool pictures of camp out on the side of some awesome mountain and I'm glassing out the front door looking at five different bases. No, I'm down in the timber, camp is hidden, and I'm, I'm trying to be downwind from where the bucks are, if you can control that, and I try to be at least a mile away. Now, like David Long and some of the backpack hunters I know, they can camp closer, but they're much more inconspicuous because, you know, small camps... They still stay in the trees, you know, stuff like that. But you have got to be careful with it. That is what is ruining the Wyoming range right now is everybody camps in those big wide open basins and, you know, horse feed right there. And there's a nice spring right here. The big bucks are in the timber before opening day because everybody's doing that. And every big buck hunter I know in Western Wyoming that know, that, that is worth their salt will agree with that statement. So you, you got to be careful with camp. Yeah. That's really interesting because, I mean, like you said, the high country stuff's popular and I think there's a lot of guys camping in that style, which, you know, some are, some probably are smart enough to pull it off and do it well. Um, some who are maybe inexperienced and just don't know better are probably, you know, tromping around too much and blowing things out mm -hmm. without realizing it for sure. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely guilty of, of putting camp. I mean, we just try to be, we just don't want to have an hour hike in the morning to get where we want to be glassing. So we'll, we'll err on the side of, you know, getting at the top of the mountain and we always try to get in cover, but sometimes that's not an option. And yeah. Um, but at the same time, going back to yeah. the point, I think you guys, Steve have the experience where you've been doing that for years and you've probably learned some hard lessons yeah. um, versus some guys who want to be up there and just, you know, probably not ill intent. Of course, they don't want to ruin their own hunch hunts, much less somebody else's, but they're just not as, um, knowledgeable about how to manage that camp if they are there for sure. So. Yeah, cool, Robbie. So let's let's kind of get into some of on the tactics side, um, some of the hunting strategies, if you will, in terms of you lay things out nicely. Um, you know, of course, you know most of our listeners are probably going to be very familiar, um, if not experienced, with the concept of spot and stalk hunting, but. You also talk about some other hunting uh, strategies, still hunting, ambush hunting, and things like that. So let's kind of begin that discussion. Um, I don't know if you want to tackle those in a certain order and lay that out, but certainly some great information in your book that we definitely want to cover tonight. You bet. I put glassing last in the book just so people would read my book um, because glassing still is in most of your country going to be your you know top technique. Um, the brusher and thicker it is, and it moves down the list a little bit. But even in thick cover, I'm still using my binoculars a lot. Um, but I put all those other techniques ahead of that because I wanted people to know that if you really want to kill big deer, you gotta you gotta get beyond just glassing. Uh, in most hunted units, even before opening day, the big bucks are in the cover. They're not where you can glass them. Um, I guide hunters every year and long range hunting is very popular. And I, I call that a technique in my book, but I'm still finding um, that in typical mule deer country, we're still killing them under 300 yards because you got to get in their living room to kill them. Um, you, you either see them up close or you see them way, way, way out there, like a mile and, and, at least not yet. Most guys can't shoot that far. And so these other techniques, and I'll just, just lay them out here, um, obeying the wind, still hunting, ambush hunting, tracking, deer drives, those are what get you in the living room right there. Those are what get you on the bigger age class bucks. Um, that's when you leave the three-year-olds that are always out in the open. They're never nocturnal. They're you know out in the morning. They're out in the evening. And some of them are pretty nice, so they start making you think that they're they're the biggest buck on the mountain. No, they're just the ones that are visible. You start getting in their living room and where these bucks spend their days, which is in the cover, um, and it varies in the you know high country. It might be timber, lower country, it might be brush, desert, it might be seven foot high sagebrush, um, or just rim rocks and stuff like that. But you got to be able to get in there and get in there undetected. Um, 
to, to kill a lot of these bucks. And, and I think that's why I've killed so many of these bucks at close range. It's, it's not that I, I mean, I practice the 600 yards. I write about it in my book. Um, but I have yet to kill a buck at that in like 38 years. Um, because I've, because number one, you don't see many of them at those extreme ranges. And a lot of times if you do, you got to get closer anyways. Um, but these bucks are creatures of the cover. They move very little. Um, especially in the later seasons, like October, you know, before the rut. And, um, by, by using these other techniques, you're not just stuck on your glass all day, which sounds really manly, but there's a lot of places and a lot of seasons. You can glass all day. You ain't going to see the big bucks because they ain't going to come out where you can look at them. But not until, you know, maybe that last few minutes of, uh, of day. And, and sometimes they stay out a little longer in the morning. And sure, you might catch them. I'm, I'm definitely the guy on the knob in the mornings too. But that sure, that leaves the rest of the day of, of, of what do I do? Um, so let's talk about obeying the wind. I talked about that, you know, if they, if they, if they smell you, you're toast, they're going to leave. All right. Um, and so all of, all of my areas that I hunt, I'm always considering the wind. I'm considering it, you know, minute by minute in some cases. And the reason I use the word obey is because if you don't, if you don't let the wind determine how you're going to hunt an area, instead of just thinking, oh, I can get away with it, you're going to get screwed more often. And and, and sometimes I, I still don't follow my own advice, and I always get reminded when I see them bounding off and I don't get a shot at them that, oh, geez, they wounded me. So you, you got a whole chapter on that, really important as you move into still hunting, ambush hunting, tracking, all that, to really consider that wind. And you may have to make a big loop around the basin to come in a different way uh, to hunt a buck, um, which – can mentally be very hard to do because you don't even know if he's there, but Hey, that's the country I think he's in. I recognize that type of brush and Aspen and Quakey. And there's a bunch of coolies down there. That's probably where a big buck is. Now I got to hike clear around the top and come in so that the wind's in my favor, just so that I can hunt it. And a lot of, honestly, a lot of guys just don't do it. They just, they just go hike through it, you know? And, um, um, and then once, once you, you know an area well enough. And this is the other thing that's going to take time, all right? And especially for those of you that don't live in the West, it's just going to take longer if you don't live out here because you got to learn your areas. Still hunting, and I just posted a video on the blog today about it and got on a couple of good bucks and there was able to video it, um, uh, is, is, is moving slowly in these areas where, where, you, where you know bucks are, you know, based on previous sightings or tracks or, you know, other deer or whatever. Um, and it's a super exciting way to hunt. And it dictates, you know, what kind of rifle you're going to shoot. That's why I don't shoot a long range rifle, uh, because still hunting requires quick shooting, uh, low power scopes. Um, that's why I like variable power scopes, you know, from like three to 10 or three to nine or four to 12, something like that. And, and when I'm still hunting and I'm in their living room, the first thing is they don't expect me because that's not what most hunters do. They sit up on the knob. Um, and so bucks will move around in the cover at, at odd hours of the day. And I've had that happen, just pussyfooting through cover and big old buck gets up and starts rubbing his antlers on the brush squats down and takes a pee and I bust him at 70 yards. Um, that, that's why still hunting is, is, is so important because if you don't, if you don't learn how to do it, there's just so many hours of the day that deer are not accessible to you. If you're only glassing <laughs> same with ambush hunting. We talked about that last time. Now ambush hunting is, um, you know, coming to a complete stop. And I write about it in the book. There's some bucks that can only be killed by coming to a complete stop, e either because the snow's crunchy, the brush is, is too thick to move through quietly, or you know, maybe the train is such that you just don't really know where he's going to show up and moving around is just alerting them to your presence. So ambush hunting is it's just kind of something I've, I've discovered in the last 15 years and as I've become more patient. Um, is a great way to kill big bucks. And if you can figure out how they're using the terrain, and we talked about saddles a little while ago, Mark, um, those those are important in ambush hunting, but they're certainly not the only place that you can kill them. You can ambush them between bedding and between um, feeding areas, which sounds really easy, but typically that area between those two are, are thick or it's really broken terrain, so it's hard to see deer moving in. And you just got to sit down and wait for them. And... Um, you can, I've killed some of my biggest bucks ambush hunting because 
And why are they the biggest? Because that's the only way you could kill them. They're, they're, they're old. They're six, seven, eight, nine years old. They're like little radar stations on their head. They know everything that's going on around in the woods. And if they don't like something, they just don't move. Everything has to be just right for bucks like that. And so ambush hunting allows you to, to take advantage of that. And that's why I, I, I put a whole chapter in there. Um, it's boring. I get it. Still hunting is actually kind of boring too, unless you're really in the bucks, but it's so important to have those techniques in your toolbox. Or again, you're stuck in camp waiting for the deer to come out of the trees. Yeah. So obviously uh, with um, still hunting, you need to know a core area of a buck. Yep. And yep. then even more defined, I think, with ambush hunting, you not only need to know a core area, but you really need to know almost his exact travel patterns um, to be within shooting range. In the instances... Like, say, for example, you just mentioned that where you've killed these big bucks ambush hunting. How was it that you um, notice, observed, and patterned those bucks? Were you, was that something you were trying to do specifically, or was it you just began to see this buck as you were hunting and then saw him again and started piecing it together and decided to try and make an ambush? I mean, how deliberate were you initially with, um, I guess, trying to make an ambush point with that buck? All the above. Um, I killed my first really big buck ambush hunting. Um, and there's a whole story in there on the book, a 36 inch Idaho, Idaho buck. I'd seen him nine days before from three miles away. Another technique, extreme long range glassing. I'd seen him from three miles away. Didn't really know how to kill him. He just came out in a little opening in the timber about the size of a school bus. And then he went back in and I didn't even know he was 36 inches. I just knew he was a good buck. And there was really no way to hunt that mountain other than go sit in that broken timber in a spot where you could see as far as you could and just wait and see if he would move. Uh, the conditions was hot, dry year that year. You couldn't really steel hunt through it. You could, but you would almost be ambush hunting because you couldn't really even take a step without making noise. And um, I killed that buck nine days later on the last morning of the season. Um, as he just came out in a little tiny opening and I had seen some other deer too. They gave me clues that the deer were using it. Um, but if I would have been walking around in there, I never would have got him. And so that, that came from, 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 from knowing the area, uh, glassing it from a long ways away and just knowing there were deer in there. Um, and, uh, I killed my best typical with a muzzleloader in Colorado doing the same thing. I saw deer using a really heavy, uh, juniper covered mountain with just a few broken openings in it. <clears throat> and then they would move from that cover down into some lower private country right at dark. But by the time they got down where the open country was there on private ground, you couldn't go down there. And so the only way to, to really hunt them was hunt them on the public and try to catch them in that bro those broken cedars and junipers as, as they would go between. And it took a couple days of watching them. And just kind of figuring it out. And then I just went in there and sat down. And I think I sat two evenings and I killed him on the second one. And um, and so so it's, it's observation, Mark. It is knowing your area. And that's what I want to make sure everybody takes away from this podcast. And I'm not going to apologize for it. If you want to kill big mule deer, you got to learn your areas. And if you don't live in the West, it's just going to take you longer. That's just the reality of it. And you're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy learning these areas. But you can't just give up on these techniques that I'm giving you because, well, I don't really know my area. That will welcome to the club. We got to learn our areas. And that that's where these knowing where to still hunt, knowing where to ambush hunt are going to come together. There, you, you've heard me say it before. There's no, there's really no formulas in buck hunting. It's just practicing these skills and you will begin to make better choices the more time you spend in deer woods but it's not really an a plus b equals c type of thing i don't i don't want to make it sound like that and so i could go to an area i just hunted an area a couple weeks ago and ryan avery killed a great big buck on an ambush hunt um my partner at rock slide because it was really the only way to hunt the area <laughs> you know a couple hundred yards of opening in the brush um I've seen a lot of tracks there over the years. I'd seen a big buck around there earlier in the fall and it was snowing really hard and we really didn't have any other choices. Couldn't glass, couldn't anything. So sat down with the wind in our favor. We weren't even there 10 minutes and this big old ruddy buck comes out grunting and snorting and Ryan pacing. I can't even 
I can't even put together what went on in my mind on why did we pick that that night other than it's just a general this is where they are they move through here they're going to be here sooner or later and i just have to be patient enough to sit yeah hey rob you want to hit a little bit it's kind of on on just deer movement in general and i and i think you kind of mentioned in the first podcast that they they have a home range of what did you mention like a mile or something a square mile yeah for for the for the particular time that you're hunting them as long as there's not a migration going on, right? You know, or, you know, sometimes the rut can really change that. You know, buck will swap areas overnight. But yeah, on average, I'm looking in less than a square mile for a, one of bucks on his summer range. Okay, and there there was two things. One, uh, flipping through your book, there was that uh, it was like a 170 buck he killed that took two years, and you, you know you couldn't you'd see him like want once and then not see him for 20 days of hunting, and then he'd pop up. Um, yes. I'm, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on that, uh, of just what do you think that deer was doing or was he just in the cover the second the sun was up, uh, and before the sun went down? Um, and then two, uh, along the same lines is if you, if you jump, say you went in there and that buck winded you and you jumped him. I think a lot of guys, you know, there's probably a, a saying of, well, you're never going to see that deer again. Um, do you think they leave that area or? Do, are they going to just still be there? If there's cover there, they're still going to be there. And I'm assuming the buck you're asking about is that big archery buck in there, the, the, the yeah. one that's in velvet. Yep. Okay, that buck right there, he, he he was six years old when I killed him. I had him lab age, so I know exactly how old he was. So he was five when I started hunting him. And that buck lived within about a square mile. Um, over the two years that I saw him, I saw him maybe a half a dozen times in that two years. And every single time he was within that square mile. Now, where was he the other 40 days I was hunting? Well, the naysayers tell me that he leaves, that, that right. no, those bucks leave. And then you just keep visiting that area. And then when they're making their rounds, they come back and you happen to catch them there. I don't believe that anymore because if that were the case, and I've tracked a bunch of pre-rut bucks, then when I was tracking these bucks unspooked, they would be leading me on big, long marches across miles of country. They don't do it, Steve. The only mm -hmm. time they do that is if I spook them. The bucks I track in, in, in the pre-rut, I'm not talking about the rut. They can move miles in the rut. Mm -hmm. In the pre-rut, most of the bucks I track are moving less than a mile. <laughs> and so the buck that you referenced in the book, I can tell you exactly where he was those, those 30, 40 days I couldn't find him, in the cover. In the, br in the brush. And, and and a square mile, I mean, in our minds, we think, oh, hey, we got him. <laughs> in typical deer country in a square mile that has cover in it, you can't even take a step without that, without that buck knowing that you're around. You've got to be so careful in hunting it. So that's a long answer to it, Steve, but I believe he was yeah. there the entire time. And um, just the way the terrain is, it's kind of rolly type terrain. There's nowhere to really get up and look at it all. I was just... It just takes a lot of hunting to be in the right place at the right time to finally get lined up and on, on a buck. And I believe that's exactly what happened with him. Um, there is an exception to that, Steve, maybe in the pre-rut too. Um, I, the really high open high country stuff that we see bucks in, in you know, July and August, I do believe that they will leave that and they may go more than a mile once the hunting pressure shows up. Or it just gets late enough in the fall if it's a draw unit that, you know, they, 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 a bunch of studies have been done on mule deer. They just kind of leave the open country as their, as their antlers harden. And those bucks may move more than a mile or so. But by and large, I, if I'm hunting pre, pre rut bucks, you know, before November 1st, um, I, I'm, I'm hunting in their living room. I know they're going to show up sooner or later. Yeah. We, we killed a, I didn't get my buddy Jason killed a buck in Wyoming last year and we, we found him in August scouting. He stalked him, you know, first weekend, you know, uh, September 2nd or something like that. Got within 60 yards, blew him up. Um, and, and I was convinced just that that buck was gone. And, and my buddy Jason, he was adamant that that buck was still going to be there. And he went back opening day rifle on the 15th and buck was half a mile from where we blew him up, you know. Awesome. 13 days prior and it, to me exactly. that that shocked me I, I thought that buck would have been gone for sure 
and and you know and sometimes and sometimes they are but i don't believe they this is what i i, I, I don't believe i don't think they they have to leave to hide mm-hmm. that's what i think is, is hard for us is that we don't believe that they can hide in 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 the timber that's close by or you know not come out until after dark but you track enough of them you find that you know what they're they're here most of the time they're here and and the, and the other thing is if they're not i don't know where else to go i might as well hunt where i've seen one that, that sometimes I, I just think that too though well even if they did leave i this is the only place i've seen him so i'm just going to keep hunting here uh-huh huh uh, tracking was another one I wanted to talk about, Mark. Have we still got time? Absolutely. Let's do it. And, and, and again, I'll say it again. There's no formulas in deer hunting. Okay. So even still hunting, even ambush hunting, obeying the wind, moving in deer country, all that stuff. I don't, don't want people to think of that as a formula. It's just a technique you need to be using. And tracking is the same way. Um, some big buck hunters I know that are very successful, they don't track. They're like, nope, I don't know what's at the end of that track, it might be a big, heavy deer with a big track, but he's got 20 inch antlers. I get it. However, tracking is still important to the big buck hunter because of a couple of reasons. Number one, early in the in, in a high country, when you get that first snow, tracking is deadly. Those bucks are, a lot of the guys are still sitting in camp because they can't see. Uh, it's all fogged in or they're sitting up on the point waiting for the, for the fog to lift. If I know where the deer are, I'm down there looking for their tracks. And I've killed a couple of my biggest deer um, by tracking. Number one, they don't move very far in the preseason. So my tracking jobs aren't, aren't very long. And, um, you know, that first snow when, when it's not frozen yet and, and the woods are just totally quiet, um, you are stealthy. You can get around without those deer seeing you. And also, I don't, I think in fog and snow and all that stuff, I think deer let their guard down a little bit. And so I think every big buck hunter has to have an awareness of tracking. Um, you won't kill even very many of your big bucks by tracking, but tracking will play a part in your success because, you know, you'll know where the deer are, you'll know when to slow down. Um, and yeah, sometimes you do track the exact buck you're looking for down and you kill him. Um, and it's one of the most exciting ways to hunt. I mean, I, I guess I say that about all these, all these, but <laughs> tracking is so cool. Um, when you are tracking, you are alert. When I'm still hunting, oh man, I'm kind of like singing a song. And, oh, I got to pay attention here. And, you know, I'm spacing off, you know, and um, maybe ambush hunting, you know, I'm chewing my fingernails, looking around, you know, watching squirrels. But man, when I'm tracking, all senses are on, you know, it's, it's me, the track and the deer. And um, I think guys need to pay more attention to tracks. The older I get, the more attention I pay to tracks and realize that you can pick out big bucks from the rest of the deer. And I'm talking the big 250, 300 pound deer. Their tracks are totally different. They're deep in the back. Um, You can just tell they're heavy deer, just no different than tracking a 180 pound guy versus a 300 pound guy. You can tell the difference in their tracks. And so I, I think all of us need to have a greater awareness of it. And um, God may even bless you someday and you'll get to track a buck down and um, actually kill it. And that will be one of the most memorable hunts you will ever have um, because it's rare, it's hard to do, but it is so cool when it comes together. Yeah, that's awesome. Imagine that's a skill that just has to take years and years of practice. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I like how Tom Brown Jr. puts it. He says tracking is just awareness. It's just awareness of what's going on. So if you think about it that way, you don't have to be an expert to do it. You just have to be aware, uh, and not just the track, but how the deer uses the country, everything. And if you think about it that way, you learn a bunch in a hurry. The other cool thing about tracking, Steve, uh, is you'll learn how these deer use the country. And it's why I'm so adamant that I don't think they really roam that much because I've tracked so many. And you'll learn where they go, where they hide. You'll you'll learn how easy it is for them to evade detection, even in semi-open country. You know, they use the coolies to get around. The you know they they skirt the brush, they stay in the shadows, and 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 you realize all that when you start tracking them. That wow, they the big bucks they don't just wander around like lost children. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a great point. I mean, it goes back to the idea that you talked about earlier as well that everything you do, you should be learning from. So even if you're tracking and you don't catch up to that deer, don't, you know, get a shot opportunity, don't even see them just by following those tracks for the bit that you do, you're learning about how they move, where they move and things like that. 
You bet. And that will help you even in different deer country, you know, because you'll remember, oh, I tracked that buck a couple years ago. And I remember how he kind of stayed in the draw. And, or if, if, you, if you're hunting the same areas, which you should be, if they're good areas, you should always, always learn your areas. Um, you're going to know when you come back to that area under those same conditions of, oh, hey, that's where the buck was. I'm going to go down there and hunt. And, and that's, that's how all these things kind of start to gel for you. And that's what I, why I keep saying. There's really no formulas. It's just practicing these things. And all of a sudden, they'll kind of all come together. And that's how I really wrap up the end of my book. And I call it the complete deer hunter. Um, and, you know, that, that very last part of the book where I'm talking about that, you know, you may um, um, be setting up an ambush hunt because you've glassed an area, you know, where some bucks are using it. And you're going to get in there and try to kill one. But while, you, while you're setting up the ambush, you cut a smoking hot, fresh track. So you switch over to tracking right away as you're tracking him. He gets down into some uh, where the snow is melted on the south side and you lose his track. But you know by the cover and the broken terrain that he's probably very nearby. You could tell by the mood of his track. He was not in a hurry. So then you switch over to still hunting. And as you're still hunting along, you come to a little opening in the in, in, in the cover and you look across the canyon. 300 yards away is a big buck down there with his head down. And 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 and. I thought about that because even though that's not exactly how one of my hunts went, it's kind of how I think about the end of many of my hunts when I finally pulled the trigger. I wasn't really just still hunting. I wasn't really just tracking. I was just doing it all. I was bringing it together by the moment of whatever the conditions called for. And bam, there he is killing. That's how it happens, I think when you become a multi-dimensional complete deer hunter versus just sitting on the knob waiting for one to stick his head out of the cover. And that's how I, that's how I tried to put together my book. And I don't get me wrong. Glasson's awesome. I still spend, that's the number one technique that I use, but yeah. all these others that we talked about today, given enough time and enough in, in the woods, you're going to want to start dabbling in these other things and it's just going to make your glassing that much more effective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it reinforces the point that there is no one formula. These are all tools in the toolbox, if you will, for sure. Yep. Yep. So, and just like, a, just like a professional, they're going to pull those tools out without even hardly thinking about it. They're going to know when they need this one for that job and that one for this job. And, um, uh, and that's how it is. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to get across to guys rather than just A plus B equals C is just get out there and learn, learn, learn about these animals. They're awesome. Yeah. And, um, that's, I think why I love hunting them so much because there's so much to learn about them. Yeah. On that point, that's, uh, the question I wanted to wrap up with tonight. I mean, Rubby, you've been hunting these mule deer for decades and you know, the process always continues. You're always learning something. So, What's something maybe this year a lesson you've learned or something you've sort of found you need to tweak? What's just something that you're continuing to learn these days after all these years of mule deer hunting? Just kind of one thing that sticks out in your mind. Super good question. And um, I thought about that a couple of weeks ago. I had um, a rut hunt of my own this year. Um, it's being uh, um, um unveiled on my blog day by day as we speak right now. It just started yesterday. Um Everybody can just stop by rockslide.com, look for the blog. Um, if, if, even if it's a week or two later, you can still go back, start with day one. And I play it out day by day. And I was hunting the rut and the migration. And um, I was reminded again this year how often you have so little time to shoot at big bucks. For whatever reason, either you spooked them or it's the terrain they live in that they just don't expose themselves much or for very long. And you got to be fast. Look through your scope. Don't look through your binoculars when you're looking at them. You know, if you see a buck, which I still make that mistake all the time, and it's cost me. Um, and be practiced at, at getting your pack off quickly. Know your rifle like the back of your hand. Shoot at um, rolling tires with your rifle, not just to learn how to um, shoot at a moving target, but to run your bolt quickly, to run your scope covers quickly, because they don't give you a lot of time. And if you can be faster on the, on the trigger, I think you can kill 50% more bucks. I really do. And, and that's a staggering number. I mean, that means... 
in my lifetime, I can kill 40 big bucks rather than 20. Um, if you're hunting right, yeah, sometimes you do. You have all the time in the world. You can lay down, you range them, you do all that stuff. But if you're having to screw around with big old turrets on your gun and, uh, you know, ballistic calculators and uh, tripods and get it, they're going to get away. They don't spend much time in the open. And you'll see what I mean if you go all the way through this live hunt with me that I'm doing right now. You'll see exactly what I mean. And so I was reminded again this year, shoot quick, fast rifles, know them intimately, run, be able to run them with your eyes shut and, um, and, and, and be as good a shot as you can. Yeah. Awesome. Very well, that's nice. great, Robbie. Thank you so much uh, again for your time. Listeners, be sure to go ahead and check out Robbie's blog at rockslide.com. Look for the blog. Is there anywhere else that you would point listeners to, Robbie, to connect with you or stay up to date? You know, um, de- definitely on the blog, um, Rock Slide's a great resource, not just for uh, mule deer hunting, but because much of, uh, or mule deer hunters, excuse me, but because much mule deer hunting occurs in the backcountry, you need to know what you're doing. Rock Slide's a good source for that. That's how I know Steve Speck, a uh, uh, big uh, uh, backcountry hunter himself, SNS Archery. Um, there's a lot of guys on there talking backcountry. I think your gear, it's almost a technique, knowing your gear, knowing how to use it. Um, um, I would recommend people get on there. And then there's a wealth of other. Uh, 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 big buck hunters out there. Um, I've mentioned some of them on these podcasts. Get out there, read their books, watch their DVDs. Um, um, just learn as much as you can. You can learn something from everybody. And that's the great thing about the off season. We have a chance to do all that. And uh, get out there and uh, hone your craft and uh, fire me a picture when you kill a big buck. I love big deer. and love to see it. Yeah. And your book is Hunting Big Mule Deer, How to Take the Best Buck of Your Life. And it's available on Amazon amazon.com and any honest reviews um, are very helpful and um, it's doing very well on there oh and if anybody's in the Idaho Falls area um, uh, I, I'm doing a book signing at Barnes & Noble uh, December 12th I, I guess this might not even be played by then but uh, if you're in the Idaho Falls area look me up whatever if you need a book signed um, uh, I love to meet deer hunters I learn something from everybody no matter their skill level awesome thank you Robbie that's a wrap. As always, you can get the show notes for this episode at exomountaingear.com forward slash for tonight's episode 18. That's 18. Additionally, be sure you consider joining or renewing your membership to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Send us that proof to podcast at exomountaingear.com. And finally, go enter to win that pack. Who doesn't want a free Exo Mountain Gear pack? So go enter exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway. We will talk to you guys again soon.